Well, thank you everyone for coming out today <laughs> with the former rain and marathon and like y'all appreciate you being here. So um, just as a little sneak peek, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience and then a little bit about our collective experience and then wrap it up with some thoughts about maybe how to practice addressing some of the things that I'm gonna talk about, which is about the nature of relationships um, according to GARP. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, and also because I failed my speech class, um, I have to have extensive notes and I'll probably likely be reading I'm not in the spontaneous department at all yet. So coming to the end of a long-term relationship was both painful and liberating. And um, as with a lot of losses, this one came with a lot of reflection and questions about what it was that I thought I knew about myself and being with another person. I took a lot of time to read and reflect and uh, <laughs> took a took that Catherine Woodward Thomas conscious uncoupling class <laughs> by myself because my partner bagged. <laughs> and, uh, and then I found out that there were a lot of single women taking the class. <laughs> uh, and um, along the way, so there were some good, there were some good things in there, but it also didn't feel like it answered a lot of my questions. And so then I um, turned to some reading and uh, I read a lot of Esther Perel, like I was kind of went through an Esther, I was a fangirl. And um, to try to better understand, you know, how we got to where we were in the relationship. So if you don't know Perel, um, she's a couples therapist and definitely a celebrity figure who's written books and given TED Talks, um, Tracing the Boundaries of Domesticity and Desire, and Dan Savage is a fanboy. <laughs> and so is uh, Lena Dunham, if that gives you any sense of her juiciness. Um, and while I actually love a lot of what she had to say, and a lot of what she didn't say but hinted at and came back around to later in some, some works, um, it also didn't quite seem to get at the root the root of the relationship problem for me. Um, and uh, giving romantic assignments, uh, rose petals and bathtubs and date nights weren't gonna fix my problem. I hate those things, they're so cringy to me. Um, so then one night I found that I was watching a remake of uh, Ingmar Bergman's Scenes from a Marriage. I don't know if any of you happened to catch that. It was um, freaking brilliant and, and intense, and something kind of clicked. Uh, the miniseries examines the nature of love, hatred, desire, monogamy, marriage, parenthood, infidelity, all the light motifs that there are. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and they gave it a modern twist, right? So they kind of flipped the script on the male role and the female role, um, which, which just seemed kind of like, I don't know, they were trying to modernize it. But anyway, one NPR critic was really disappointed and said, oh my God, there's nothing new or interesting to this story. But for me, it was like, yes, exactly. There isn't anything new here. That was my light bulb moment. Um, that this many years later, we're still experiencing the same dramatic reenactments in our relationship, probably for the last 2,500 years or longer. So it made me think that there could be a problem in my approach to relationships and also explain why the Swedish divorce rate doubled uh, right after that aired <laughs> in 1973, fact. Yeah, no, sir, true, true story. Maybe we're like, oh my God, <laughs> there's no hope. Uh, we want Christmas bows and homework assignments, God damn it. Um, anyway, so I started to see patterns in my relationship and these patterns, not always, but often were reflected in um, the patterns that I saw in other couples as well, and also in our culture at large. So this is the fodder for today's rambling talk and 
I don't have answers or pretty boxes or homework assignments, but I hope that there are there's something useful in it. Um, so uh, we are so not back in the saddle again. <laughs> and by that, I mean, um, I'm still single. And when you're single, all of your friends want to know when you're getting back in the game. And they're very enthusiastic amnesiacs. Uh, they talk about how great love is, you know, and they sell it to you like multi-level marketing, and you're just one dinner party away from being a bazillionaire. It's the best thing. And they, they say things like, uh, you know, don't you want to feel that way again, you know, before you hated the way she chewed her food? Um, are you open to dating? Um, what if you found the one? And uh, don't you believe in love anymore? Uh, to which I say it's complicated. So what do we talk about when we talk about love? And this is me asking myself because I really don't have an answer. Well, I for one learned a lot about what love was, I guess, from watching my parents. Um, and it was a broken model, I'd say that's fair. And, um, and so after a certain point, you kind of turn away from that and look at the culture around you. And let's face it, you know, you can learn calculus and how to make a drone in high school, and a, but you cannot identify and manage a feeling without needing a Rosetta Stone. Like, I mean, it's just not taught in school. We don't have any real referent for it if we don't get it from our families. So then we turn to the culture at large and learn all the great things that we need to know about life through uh, television and pop music <laughs> and celebrity culture. So based on my uh, extensive research at 58, here are some observations that I've learned about love in our culture. It's fickle as fuck. We're always falling in and out of it. As Heidi Klum says, you know, one day you're in and the next you're out. <laughs> and as a whole, we seem to enjoy the pursuit of it more than the gain. And the unpredictable nature of it brings out the crazy in us, the really neurotic behavior as we try to figure out how we can make that relationship last. And I mean, make it eternal. Like, I'll see you in the next round. <laughs> I think I actually said that early in my marriage, and I saw the color drain from my partner's face. <laughs> um, love is also transactional. Uh, it looks like it, it's quid pro quo. What have you done for me lately? So we withhold something that the other person wants until we get what we want. Um, affection, time, sex, money, house, kids, car. Um, and then the relationship begins to feel a lot like work, and we have to earn our place in the marriage. And, um, you know, let's face it, uh, unless you're married to the government, you could get fired. So, um, another observation is that love is leaky, it's limited, there's only so much of it to go around. Uh, like television sets on Black Friday. So we are fighting for resources and we get a little crazy, a little pushy, we, we competitive, we run each other down with our shopping carts trying to get to um, that source of love. Um, and this love is based on scarcity. And uh, it, it causes us to sort of get in a gamey place where we're trying to win and possess. Um, and we uh, cling to that yummy dish like saran wrap. So then the final observation is that love is also hurtful. Um, and there's a lot of music about that and I'll spare you. I was gonna sing Nazareth to you, but, but I won't. <laughs> I might though. Love hurts, love wounds, love scars. Okay, anyway. Unmet needs and expectations can trigger a lot of powerful emotions and get acted out in really aggressive and even violent ways emotionally and physically. Um, the loss of love lights up parts of our brain that are linked to physical pain, I read, and, um, and it depletes our feel-good neurotransmitter neurochemicals. And so we really crash. We really do physically experience pain with people when we feel a loss of love. And, 
Yeah, so those are four things. And so then, uh, it, you know, what is love? Because like, if this is love, what's hell? <laughs> well, I'm hoping that love isn't really any of that. And uh, that none of those qualities really describe love, but it does describe another um, experience, which is craving or desire. So we don't really grow up learning how to separate love from desire. And really, if you think about it, it's the entree to the dance, right? You have you sort of desire somebody, and then that's from there you pursue the relationship. So it's, it's kind of a gateway drug, and, um, but it gets mixed up and it kind of stinks up the container of love, like, a, like garlic. But desire, what, in all of its forms, whether it's for a toy, a candy, experience, another person, it's obviously a powerful force. And if you've got any kids, you know this one really well. And if you don't, just go to Target on any given day, especially around Christmas time, and watch the kids when they want something really bad. And it goes like this. You start, you ask nicely. No. Oh, come on. You know you want to give it to me. I'm charming. I'm cute. I'm funny. No. That's okay, I'll ask dad. Uh, then it's no again. So then the kid resorts to shaming and drawing attention and enlisting the help of onlookers to sort of shame the parents into giving them the treat. And then defiance. She goes and pulls it off the shelf and sticks it in the cart, hides it under the socks. It's found, goes back, rage, cry, ugly crying, then acceptance that nothing good will ever happen to her ever again. Then she gets to the car and collapses into sleep, wakes up, and goes on to the next craving. I'm like, oh my God, that's me dating. That is, <laughs> yes, to all of that. Um, so there's really no way to that I could find to talk about relationships without talking about this desire. And, um, and then trying to think about, well, how do you, the desire is sort of the problem. How do you get at eradic eradicating it? You know, that's what I want to do. Make it go away. Um, so Judith Simmer Brown, she she's, uh, wrote about the role of desire in, in um, Buddhist Tantra. And she says, experience of anxiety and sorrow from desire is a kind of craving. We pursue pleasure and avoid pain to feel happy. But um, like a child's birthday party, it always ends in tears. Our impulse towards pleasure creates an endless series of frustrating experiences for us until we recognize our lives are driven by unfulfilled desire and we can't find any peace. Suffering, this is suffering. Um, there are uh, different methods of working with suffering that we know about uh, through the Dharma that can help us with relationships like the Eightfold Path. Uh, and we've been talking about this a lot during our recovery meditation, um, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, and right mindfulness, and right concentration, um, and then trying to do all of those all at once instead of one at a time. And, um, and I think that that is wonderful and it slows things down and it gives us an opportunity to, to kind of breathe and observe our behavior and bring it to consciousness. But um, there's also in Vajrayana, this idea that desire being a kind of working basis for compassion I find really interesting. Lamala often points out that our desire to please other people, you know, whether that's looking nice, um, through dance, through singing, um, engaging with them in conversation, and 
if you've ever been to expressions, that sort of showing up for somebody and having it be beautiful and magical is really powerful. It, it's, um, there's an intelligence at play that's not self-centered. Um, so desire, I like this idea that desire could be a, a doorway to empathy. And um, Simmer Brown says that it, it does teach us about empathy because it allows us to experience um, the other five realms and to feel uh, what it feels like to be in somebody else's shoes. You know, for example, to experience intense jealousy mirrors the experience of the jealous gods. And and you can feel how, how, um, how painful it is. Anger and disdain, she says, are similar to what beings experience maybe in the hot and cold hells. And unending yearning reflects the experience of hungry ghosts. And I would say I'm very intimately acquainted with that one. And if we're aware of the suffering of other others, then we can feel empathy and compassion and the desire to liberate them from their suffering. And in this way, habitual self-centered desire turns towards care for others and spiritual transformation is possible. And she says, this is the practice of a bodhisattva, one who's committed to clarity of understanding and the welfare of others. The fuel for this practice is desire which has been transformed into the awakened heart. And without the self-centeredness, passion is expressed as devotion to others, as caring skillfully and utterly about their welfare. But it's not easy to transform poison into medicine, um, to honor passion without lapsing into self-centered desire for gain. But it does feel much closer to finding true love and true liberation. So circling back to one of the early questions was, do I believe in love? I absolutely, 100%, utterly, completely do. It's really, I think, all that there is in life and the only thing that matters. And for that reason, it deserves to be practiced consciously. That's all I've got. Thanks. And uh, open for questions, but really, I would like to prefer to ask you a question. You know, how do you deal with difficult emotion? How do you de 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 deal with your, uh, how do you practice while in a relationship or thinking about one? Can I take this off? Okay. Okay. I have no idea how to operate this, so. Guys, <laughs> so good to see you. Love you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. It, I'm sure, it touches everyone. It's just complex, as you said, so it takes some thought to think of what might be a comment. Um, I think the, the concept of desire being desire that is brings a positive to you or the other, or the desire that brings a negative from craving and grasping and hanging on to some um, thought for yourself. So for me, I think the important thing is to always have the other in mind and recognize when you're you're thinking of yourself and, and examining that because sometimes it seems like oh i want to make this good for my partner or the other person mm -hmm. when really if you think about it and you sit with it or you meditate on it you're going well yeah that's what i really want to come up with you know so i think the awareness and actually sitting with your um thoughts and your behaviors toward the other and where are they really coming from mm -hmm. are they coming from a desire 
um, a strong desire to make them happy, which will make you happy mm -hmm. if they're happy. Mm -hmm. So that's just my comment on the situation. I love that. I, I, I really like that. So do you, you think that is, how do you bring that, like, is that from meditation? Is that kind of a, um, well, it's hard to do that face to face sometimes I find. And I also find that I'm really sneaky. Like, I really can bullshit myself into thinking it's for you, and I might get something out of it. Do you ever? I, I, yeah, I think I think it's it's really the awareness and recognizing maybe also when the other is truly doing something for you and accepting that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's that interplay mm -hmm. between the other. And I also believe the other person has to be very willing to talk about whatever the issue is. Mm. And uh, I think that's that's a really important thing for you to then, then stop and possibly meditate on it or, or just, you know, consciously remind yourself to be aware. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Thank you. I, I just, uh, I, I, I just, so many things came to my mind. I just loved your talk so much. I, and um, like, one thing that stood out to me is, uh, well, many things, but one thing right now is that um, how desire transforming into empathy. And um, because, uh, you know, we sometimes feel so trapped by our desires, you know. And I read not too long ago, a teacher, I think it was on, it just on social media or something like that, but I, it struck me, I can't remember the teacher's name, but it's a great master and it was a quote attributed to him regarding kind of something to the fact like when when you you know we spend a, in our tradition a lot of time examining our our motivations and ourselves in meditation it's one of the things that we're we're called to do and and by and in this quote he was saying when we know ourselves thoroughly like the whole landscape then we know everyone you know that's that was the quote mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. but I, I liked that a lot but when when your your question, what do you do when you feel captured? Is that was that the question? No, but I like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I, I guess maybe I added that maybe because that I is. feel very captured. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking how am I? Um, I have unskillfully, as you know, run around the block in clogs, <laughs> but that's not really what we're looking for. So I don't suggest. Um, but I, I think uh, what I've done is I. Uh, you know, kind of talked it out with a good friend who can kind of challenge me a little bit and say, really, Patty, is that really, I don't see it like that. And I feel so relieved when like, I get lost with my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes in sitting in practicing meditation, I actually need someone to talk to. I need someone to talk to and listen to yeah. me and challenge me a little bit. That's kind of when I'm in a bit, really difficult spot. I, I need help. And I, I look for help, a helper because I, I, I really know I'm, I'm not seeing things as they are, and I need somebody to kind of shine a, a light where I can't at that moment. This is when I'm in a very difficult spot. Mm -hmm. So also, uh, one thing that comes to my mind is like, um, all the things that I've faced over the years have really humbled me, you know, and that's not a bad thing. You know, I don't, I find myself less and less, like if somebody comes up with some kind of negative um, jealousy or anger or whatever I'm like yeah that's a hard one I don't I don't think oh well, look at them I think well yeah I actually feel very deeply yeah that's a hard one that's I so much of what you just said is really resonating with me as well like um the need for friends uh, uh dharma I don't know for me dharma friends uh there's there's a language there's kind of a shorthand I think some of my other friends, they're great for just spilling the tea, but they are not going to get this. And you're like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? <laughs> get the ring. Um, but uh, so having friends that you can talk to, and I've had people here who have, who have showed up for me. Um, I'm not a, not a public crier. I cry in my car on the way home usually. <laughs> Patty's lesson. 
Um, but um, but I think it, I w one of the things that I hear you saying is that those things don't go away. It's like, oh yeah, jealousy, oh yes, desire, oh, this feeling, that feeling. And I, it reminds me of something that, uh, that Lama talks about is, um, so what do you do? You know, you want you want to you want to kind of have the big feeling, the big powerful emotion, whatever it is. You you want to kind of like make it go away, put out the fire. Um, but to just sit with that fire and look at it and, and look at what it's bringing up, um, you know, it's pissing you off or. You know, is it is shame, you know, is it shame? Is it like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that again. You, you know, but not, not projecting it out onto the world, not shutting it down, which is down the middle, right? That's what you said, down the middle. Just watch it, be with it, look into it. Uh, and that is, feels like maybe the start of being able to transform that is, I think it's really difficult to do with others. <laughs> In the moment, you know, when you're engaged with somebody else and it starts to, you have these feelings come up, that is really, how do you get that gap so you can kind of get some space to hold it? Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you. Um, so talking uh, about desire and, and relationships and love specifically, um, uh, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm engaged right now. Um, but before um, I, you know, met my partner and everything, I always had the, the belief that um, we are not born with soulmates. Um, we, through our, you know, growth as a person, um, are, I study plants, I try to think of everything in terms of plants, and, and we are like plants, and um, your soulmate is something that you make when you grow together through having a similar um, desires. That's, that's how I think of it, and those desires necessarily, you know, sometimes you, you might desire, uh, you know, something that would bring you um, you know, some not good feelings like uh, struggling to, you know, accomplish something or desiring to, um, you know, create this, this life full of things that you are um, enjoying and sharing. And we actually have an, an open relationship and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think through that, we have fleshed out the idea that we are together because we want the same things out of life. Um, and that is not generally, I think, what is presented in, you know, most, most media when you think of like a relationship and everything, it's, it's more of a, um, shared connection of, of what we feel our lives are supposed to pan out. Um, so thank I thought your talk was very inspiring. So thank you. <laughs> thanks. For, thanks for that observation. I, I just. Congratulations on your engagement. And um, already it sounds like you have open communication and kind of a, you've discussed all of this in advance. There's a kind of mindfulness there. I think you're going into it way ahead of it where I ever was. So I'm, good I'm, for you. I'm from Indiana and um, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. So it's not like there's, <laughs> we just kind of found each other and we're like, well, we got to make this work. So. <laughs> That's great. So thank you. Yeah. We have a uh, we have a comment. I'd love for you to read it. Not having a senior moment. <laughs> Uh, 
So we have so a <laughs> comment from Autumn Payne, and she says, I feel like our culture makes too much of love in that we put it on a pedestal that it has to be perfect, deep, and con unconditional. But I feel like love is easier and more common than that. You can love a stranger spontaneously. You can love friends and acquaintances without knowing every piece of them. And you can love people you are at odds with. There are many kinds of love and many forms of love do not contain desire. Things get complicated in long-term relationships, but to, to her, that's not because love is complicated. It's because relationships are. And... Nice. Yeah. Um, and then Autumn also says that she's reminded uh, of a quote from her friend that she has on her wall. Um, it says, normalize telling your friends that you love them. Make it weird. <laughs> yeah. That is great. Love that. Hey, hey, Jack. See, so you've. I don't actually see that you've raised your hand, but I've been told you have. So please, like, honestly, I just don't know what's happening here. But please. Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you so much for your talk. Um. It's really beautiful. Um. I would say that a big uh, thing that brought me to the Dharma was just failure, after failure, um, within relationships and a lot of attachment issues and trauma around relationships and whatnot. Um, and one thing I think that Lama has really impressed on me, you know, I'll, I'll be kind of firm with myself that like, I need to stick with these things. I need to, you know, sit with these complex feelings and emotions and really get in there. And what he's really had me do is just start with kindness towards myself. Mm -hmm. So, before I actually engage with any of that stuff, I need to be kind to myself. And I've started doing a lot of tar practice in the last couple of months, and I've noticed this kind of warmth toward myself. And, you know, I don't know how connected it is. I think it is connected, but I noticed that with my partner, I feel this kind of sense of kind detachment from him in a way that like I can see him as this autonomous, different individual with whom I have a strong connection, but I don't have this kind of, just that kind of nasty attachment where it's like, I need to have this person, you know, I need to like, mm -hmm. this person is mine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's becoming this kind of kindness that allows for um, autonomy, which is beautiful. So that's just what I wanted to share, Thanks. kindness. Yeah, I love that. And I, I think, you know, absolutely, like, it makes sense to me that we have to be kind to ourselves, we have to love ourselves and be kind to ourselves in order, I mean, you can't extend what you don't know, what you don't experience, so um, that, thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to uh, say that um, Lama Jimpa told me the very same thing, Jack, like um, in the same way, like I reach towards friends, but to be a friend to myself in the sense of like, uh, you know, sometimes I feel great, great uh, shame to have a, even such a feeling, especially, you know, something like, you, you know, like you just want to be something more than you can ha actually manifest in that moment. And then, uh, so then he just said to send myself love, which I think is the same thing as Jack is that you're saying, but um, but anyway, I just wanted to just say that he's telling, I think all of us that same message actually. Mm -hmm. Hi, Janice, Ellen, can you hear me? Yeah, hey, Ellen. Hi, I really liked what you said too, and just piecing together a few parts of it, and thinking about this idea of um, you know love versus desire, for me, uh, marriage. One thing I really liked about it was the way that society gives you sort of permission to have this unabashed, super deep love for somebody. You know, it's like the world aligns around you doing that, and it's really fantastic to feel like you have permission to do that. Whereas with strangers, it's 
really not quite that way, you know, people that are more acquaintances. But on the other hand, you know, you pointed out there's this resource issue when you're in a committed relationship and you'd like to exhibit that, it does take a lot of time and energy. And so one thing I appreciated not being in a relationship was like that is the bandwidth you have to develop that kind of, you know, expression with many other people. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, you know, we were talking about how your your friends and maybe colleagues encourage you to get back on the horse. And I wonder if when people do that, if they're thinking more of the desire aspect, you know, like, hey, don't you want to feel that desire again? Don't you want to feel that infatuation? Because the love part of it, as you point out, is like, you can do that with anybody, anytime. Um, I don't feel, not being in a committed relationship, I don't feel like I don't have the opportunity to do that anymore. And I've, I've, I've sort of willingly given up that working on that, you know, dealing with that desire, infatuation, dating, cyclical, samsaric cycle that you described. So I wonder if, you know, there's sort of social expectation that it's, it's reasonable or good to be in that desirous cycle, when in in reality, it's doesn't feel like it's all that productive. So thank you for, you know, kind of putting all those pieces in front of us. It's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, have uh it's it's like a a moving puzzle pieces right now for me like i think would i like to be in a desire state (laughs) yeah all the time please (laughs) uh do i think that's healthy probably not you know lights up the same places um as your chemical addictions so if that's any indication so it's, it's no wonder that we're, there's this like little you know mice hitting that wanting that dopamine hit um i i have no reference for um a healthy marriage or a healthy <laughs> healthy relationship except with bailey my dog and i think it's pretty healthy <laughs> no but um i don't know i mean i guess to, to them i I don't, this is why I said they're like amnesiacs. It's like, why, why do we have to just do this? I mean, I know it's resources. I know it's kind of a social institution. I heard myself in a recovery group calling it the marriage machine. And I'm like, oh my God, who said that? It's like war machine. But that's, that's, just, that's my trauma response, I think. Um, but it does get to feel more uh obligatory than spontaneous most of the time like and like you have to be home at a certain time and you have to fix the dinner and you got to do all the things and it's like i don't know it's like it's like such a such a i don't it's like trying to think outside of the paradigm you can't i mean it's almost like right you try to how do you think outside of your enculturation? Don't know. On that happy note. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. I, I loved your talk Thanks. so much. It's so much to consider. And um, I think from the I think that I am not alone in feeling this way. I know I'm not. So thank you so much. Oh, my God.